Welcome to Pop Culture Retro, which was recently voted the 15th best podcast by the residents of the Golden Years Retirement Community in Boca Raton, Florida. Each show, we'll revisit some of your favorite pop culture memories with insider and outsider perspectives. Now, please help me welcome your hosts, Ike Eisenman and Jonathan Rosen. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Pop Culture Retro. I'm one of your hosts, Jonathan Rosen, along with Ike Eisenman, and we're going to do the our second part of our favorite horror movies by decade, and we're going to go this week with the 1980s, and this is going to be a fun one, 1980s to 2010s, but before we do, today is October 27th, Wednesday, October 27th, and this weekend, you have something coming up in Orlando. You have oh. a film festival, yes, and we've got to plug it. So October 29th well, and October 30th, October 29th at four o'clock, October 30th at 8 p.m. Let, tell us a little bit about that so our viewers, whoever's in Orlando, can go see it. Well, there's a, a truly lovely um, documentary that has been made, um, I want to say about me, but featuring uh, featuring me in, the, in, 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 in most of the story um it is called dear ike lost letters to a teen idol and it's made by um an incredible filmmaker dion labriola who um i'll try to it, it, it's it's it it's such an interesting film and i and by the way i just want to say that i've seen it and it's fantastic <laughs> oh well thank you I'm, I'm really i say thank you i i was just involved in it i i yeah. i I didn't have anything to do with making it, but Dion is really did make a beautiful film. And it was about his experiences um, as a teenager uh, trying to write to me um, and get letters to me and I, which I never received. And he embarked on this epic journey to try to contact me because he had high hopes as a young person to be a filmmaker and an animator and, and learn through various sources about how I had similar interests and just knew that we should be working together on his, on his huge, big, epic animation <laughs> project. And, but yet uh, he never, never got into contact with me and through a series of, you know, as life uh, bears out coinc incredible coincidences, um, ended up meeting somebody who was a good friend of mine. And then we ended up coming kind of coming together and he had this idea to make this film about this this whole experience and it's 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 really lovely and it's it's a screening at the Orlando Film Festival as as you said on October 20th 29th um, oh, yeah. at 4 p.m. and Saturday the 30th at um, 8 p.m. I'm going to be attending both screenings so um, hopefully we won't have too big of a mad rush but uh, would love <laughs> to see anybody would like to here? come to see the film. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if we're doing a Q and A or not, but I will. Oh, okay. uh, I will be there. The filmmaker will be there. The producer and my dear friend Andy Steinland will be there. So it's going to be uh, a really, uh, really great event. So um, would love to see, love to see people. Well, if, come, if and, come and check it out. You can start putting your your questions in the comments here. Maybe we could uh, address them on the show. And yeah, we're going to try well, to we're going to try to have uh, Dion on the show one week. Uh, yes, we are absolutely, definitely, definitely in the near future. I, I, so. I've got to say, I, I saw this film and it was it was funny. It was heartwarming. Uh, there was some really sweet, you know, even like bittersweet a little bit moments in uh, this film and uh, really touching parts in this. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. It's 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 been getting a great reception and I'm really super happy for, for Dion. He did a, an amazing job with something that's that's a little even hard to comprehend as when I worked on it, I didn't quite understand what it was going to be. As he worked on, it, he interviewed me, and then, and then built this film around the interview and other interviews that he has in it. And it's 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 amazing. It's very different, and it's no, all, yes. it's all a true. It's a true story. It's a it's a true story, which is um, which also just makes it that much more rich for me. So well, there it I is. hope I hope people <laughs> come out to see it. I hope uh, I hope you know a lot of people, whoever's in the Orlando area, please make sure you go check that out. And uh, now, I guess, let's go on to our, our horror edition Alrighty. part two. <laughs> uh, we're going to go 19, we're going to start with 1980s. And now, it's, uh, we're starting with me this week, I know. Here's where we go. And I'm going to get all the comments. Every single one along the rest of the way is going to be my, my hybrid humor 
horror hybrid from every decade. And uh, there were so many fun ones in the 80s. And I, I don't want to, and well, I'm not going to mention one because I know that your pick for the 80s. So I won't mention that one. <laughs> <laughs> so, but there was, there was also the Lost Boys, there was Poltergeist, Fright Night, all these fun Halloween. I mean, and Nightmare on Elm Street. I love Freddy Krueger too. Uh, all these really fun ones in the eighties. But I went with here we go. I went with Gremlins. Gremlins is my favorite one because you still had the scary moment, and you still had it. To, I've watched it. We talked about rewatchability last week. I've watched that. I don't know how many hundreds of times Gremlins. And it's, I still love that movie. I, it still cracks me up. There are still some scary parts, some really disturbing scary parts in there too. But uh, I just love that movie. That's a great, that's a great pick. Cause I, I it, it, it's funny. It was talking, the documentary filmmaker that um, I did an interview for regarding um, 80s sci-fi movies, he had done uh, the 80s horror films also. And when, he was giving me the list of all the sci-fi films. I didn't see Gremlins on it. And so I asked him about it. He said, no, I covered that in the horror um, <laughs> horror side. And I thought, yeah, I guess, of course, absolutely. It, it would be. I, I kind of oh, thought Dante it was a little bit more science, more science fiction than, than, than horror, but, but n not, not at all. And I think that's a great pick. I, I, I loved, I loved the movie. Um, and I've watched it many times too. I haven't seen it in a very long time. And I have a, um, I think a fascinating insider story about oh, uh, about that. Where I love um, when that comes up. <laughs> yeah, it. I I um I I had had an actual interesting kind of impromptu meeting with Steven Spielberg on the set of um, uh, the Twilight Zone, and um, he how, how, wait how, how, we've been doing this for how many months? And this is the first time you you bring up well, see, Spielberg. I, yeah, <laughs> I love I love to I love to save these things for for oh, the show to share okay. it with everybody. Um, but, uh, yeah, I had to, I had to meet with him very briefly on the set and, um, and as I'm standing there chatting with him, this guy comes up with this little doll in his hands and he's waiting patiently as he and as Steven and I are talking and suddenly Steven says, well, okay, wait a minute, just give me a second here. And he says, he says, what have you got? I don't remember the guy's name, but he says, here, here's the final, here's the final for you. And he holds up Gizmo. I mean, oh wow! Like, and I, I had no idea what it, what it was. And and Steve looked at him. He says, "I love it. It's perfect. Let's go with that." And then we went back and had our chat. And that was that was the like the end of my interaction with with Spielberg. But I didn't know until I saw Gremlins that I was one of the first people to wow. see Gizmo like the final version of the little doll. And it was just, he was just there with his big eyes. And I thought, I thought it was the coolest little creature I'd ever seen. And I thought, my God, it's Spielberg. What could this be about? And I had no idea. And of course I wasn't going to ask him because what was he going to tell me, <laughs> you know? So, so yeah, I have that little claim to fame when it comes to <laughs> Kismo. Spielberg and I were That's both great. standing there when he, when he, uh, when he, yeah, when he um, decided that that was the perfect uh, character for the film. So there so, it is. Just remember, Ike Eisenman saw Gizmo before anyone else. Really. Oh yeah, before anybody else. So yeah, yeah, that's how cool I am. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. Yeah, yeah, it was a blast. But no, okay. I love that film. I love that film. It's just I, uh, it cracks me up. There, it's so to me, it's so funny. A lot of yeah. it too. But they're definitely, like I said, there are some, and I I know that they were supposed to be even thicker. I mean, we see have Gremlins getting exploding in the microwave originally i think they were supposed to kill the dog they changed it because they didn't want to harm the animal <laughs> you know, so to... oh thank goodness yeah yes. yeah <laughs> so no the but, microwave uh... moment i think is my favorite in the whole film yeah just oh, like oh but they, i mean it's... they they do kill oh. people i mean they really they, they kill it's yeah and, but each one is like kind of a funny way that they do it and, but it's yeah it's really <laughs> gruesome a lot of the scenes in there <laughs> so I need to watch it again. It's been a long time. And I think it'd be fun, especially during this season. So maybe by the time the show's on this, this show posts, I will have, uh, I will check it out again. Well, it's one of the things that uh, I watch every, around every Christmas time, every, you know, every December time. I, it's one of the movies that I throw on there. <laughs> so. Well, since you already know my pick, mm -hmm. everyone probably can guess my pick. It's The Shining. Um, 
I, um, I, I, of course, it's a Stanley Kubrick film. Of course, it's controversial in so many ways because um, because Stephen King hated it so much, um, and I can completely understand why. But um, I had not read the book The Shining before seeing the movie for the first time, and this often happens for me with Stephen with um, Stanley Kubrick films, which is interesting um, for me anyway. They don't always impact me as much on the first my first viewing as they do subsequent view views as i watch the films over and over and over again the shining kind of caught me off guard when i saw it in the theater for the first time and i i i was so excited because it was another stanley kubrick film because i've been a kubrick fan since i was very young as i've said many times um and 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 it 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 fit the horror genre perfectly, but it was such a different kind of horror movie that I didn't quite know how to take it at first. And, um, and also this is just a historically interesting fact about the film as a film. Um, this is talked about in, if anyone has the DVD or the bonus features for The Shining in any online um, version of it, there's a documentary that was made about the making of The Shining by, um, yes. by Kubrick's daughter, which is an incredible um, documentary to see, um, you know, just gives a little bit of insight into, you know, the filmmaking, of course, and Kubrick's style of filmmaking. But she also does a commentary track over the documentary and talks about making the documentary and some some details about The Shining. Um, and she brought up this particular glitch that happened. The worst thing that can happen during the making of a film happened on The Shining during the shooting of the very last shot. And I'm, I'm getting to this, I'm getting this anecdote before I sort of talk about why I like it so much now, but, but it was one of the things that unfortunately pulled me out of the film at the very end and made it very difficult to, to focus was the, the, the end of this film, which is the big reveal that, um, you know, the Jack Nicholson's character is really been haunting this, you know, establishment all along by the camera pushing in through the space and, ending on a close-up of this photograph showing him in the front back in the 30s or 20s or something right. like that so that's the big reveal at the end it's like okay it's always been him all the time and now we know but this was a very long complicated essentially complicated shot that once they had when i saw it in the theater as the shot's moving along all of a sudden out of the blue this black scratch mark in the film is just there this big black line and and it's wavering a little bit and i'm looking at it going oh my god this is a this is a scratch negative there was a scratch negative why did they use this why wouldn't if he, he reshot this shot and fixed this and of course this is back in the film days now we have digital and we have all kinds of ways right. to fix things like that but 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 I learned through this documentary, and I didn't understand. I didn't know anything about it at the time because it was never talked about in the trades or anywhere else. But apparently, they had completed that shot. They got the take they wanted, and yes, there was inside of a thirty-five millimeter camera. There's what they call the gate, which is this little this piece of metal that film is pulled through, and throughout my entire career every time every time we finished a shot or a scene um the assistant cameraman would say okay before we before we move on let me check the gate and he opens up the camera looks hmm. at the gate to see if there's any dirt or any burrs or anything that might have scratched the film positive um and there have been times when, when, when they've said, yeah, I think we've got some dirt in here. Let me clean the gate and let's shoot one more take for safety. So we've done this before. And that's it's a common practice. And somehow the most technically savvy, insanely detail-oriented filmmaker of all time ended up 
with a shot in this film where there was a scratch on the on on the film they didn't see it at the time when they shot they wrapped the film it was the last thing they did at the end of the film and by the time the film was processed they had already started tearing down the set huh. and so they could not go back rebuild it and reshoot this scene again they like he literally had to use a scratched wow. negative oh, oh, oh. to um to to for the final shot and of course all versions of the shining now has the digitally restored um <laughs> shot so you you don't see that but i just remember watching this watching the film and thinking okay i i i i, I like this and i want to like this i don't know if i do like this and then oh my gosh the last scene you there's a scratch there's you know, a scratch print and i thought what on earth is going on here so all that being said by the time it, you know, I ended up going back to the theater and watching it again and thinking, oh my God, this is a really freaking freaky film. And then it coming out on DVD, I started watching it over and over and over again. And I got drawn into it more and more and more. And every time I see the film now, I get more out of it. Right. It's like the score, the, the, the music score, which is the thing that, I mean, if you watched it in silence, it wouldn't, it wouldn't make you uncomfortable at all. It wouldn't be really that terrifying but the way he used the film score it's much like it reminds me of psycho it reminds me of psycho because the music as simple as psycho was the music in the shining is very complex very complicated very atmospheric and ethereal and he used the same composer that he used on 2001 and i never pronounce his name right george george georgie leggetti um who does these incredibly abstract and strange pieces of music and they're so like almost cartoonish in their in their in their horror in 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 in, in the horror support of the movie and and there are moments where i still jump because the music builds to a pitch and then cuts cuts to silence in a way that's almost like that flash that horror films will do flash the creature at you flash the blood at you flash the knife at you it's these it's the exact opposite in this film where all of a sudden taking it away is as terrifying as having it come out at you. Hmm. And I still think, I still think you can, you can match me for horror movies, slasher movie, period. The most terrifying moment in any horror film because the tension was built so flawlessly is when Scatman Crothers is coming is finally gets to the hotel and he's finally walking through and you spend so much time with him that you think okay what's he going to find or where's where's he going to go how far is he going to go and all of a sudden jack nicholson comes out and and kills him with an axe and it's like that's it he's dead their only hope of survive of, of escaping and it, it just it comes out of nowhere it comes in for me and i still love that moment to this day and i just think the re like yeah okay i'm gonna contain myself so I don't go on too much <laughs> but what what i like about it is that there are no there are no tricks there are no special effects in this movie it's pure cinema pure cinema the use of brilliant editing to you know especially when you go into the bar with jack nicholson and he's in there by himself it's completely empty and he looks up and just starts talking to a guy and you cut and then there's the bartender and there's the bar full of full of booze behind him. It's on an edit. It's on a moment. It's not like it fades in, you know, like the ghost is fading in. It's just it's all handled through pure, pure cinematic artistry. And I think that's that's what i admire the most about it and um and yeah and i watch it every halloween now i only watch it every halloween because i've seen it so many times i don't want to oversee it but i i i it's it's just yet another one of those movies that i can watch oh i can watch endlessly and and absolutely get lost in and thoroughly enjoy a, so. a great great movie no, i i yeah. agree with you it's a great movie it is one of my favorites too uh i like you, I understand why Stephen King did not like it based on his book. And I, you and I have said this before, and I know this is blasphemous to a lot of people. I like it more than the book. I like the movie more than the book. And, you know, I know we'll get killed for that. 
Oh, I know. No, is. I mean, I think we have talked about it before. I, yep. I, I only read the the Shining um, as a novel in the last uh, year, year and a half, because I thought, I thought I need to. You know, I so this is what I do. It's part of it's part of what I enjoy is 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 you know um, experiencing the sources of these of these great movies. Um, if I haven't read them first, and I did not read the Shining, like I said, the movie was my my experience of it, and. And I think I've said this before, and I think this quote is out there somewhere. So it's not something that only I've heard about. But what what Kubrick, his comment about was, and I don't like the book. I do not enjoy the book. I thought the book was was like it was not scary to me. Um, it had entirely it was too thick. It had too much backstory about too many things that just didn't add up to enough to create the kind of terror that I would expect. I think from Stephen King, um, and yes, it is blasphemy. I know I, I'm 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 going to get um, lambasted for this, but I, Kubrick said he wrote he wrote half. He wrote a really good ghost story and then destroyed it. <laughs> it was like he was writing this great ghost story and then he destroyed it himself. So Kubrick simply took out everything that he thought was what made it a really great ghost story and then and then made his own version of it. But, you know, the man was powerful enough. How do you how do you not give Stanley Kubrick the rights to your novel? (laughs) But he's also clever where he's going to take the rights and he's not going to give you any say whatsoever in what he does with them. Um, well, he, he, he had that he had that clout also yeah 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 oh, oh yeah that's what i mean you, you, right, yeah, yeah. He, a... he did this he did the same thing with um with uh with full metal jacket uh that was also based on a short brilliant short novel and we need to I save this for book. the yeah. we'll have to save it for no it's one of the best novels you will ever read and it's, well, it's the only one gustav, gustav hosford is the author and it was called the short timers it's a, it, it is, it, it's, it's, it's not a very dense book at all, but it's, it, the prose is incredible, you know, t- to have a true artist who, who, you know, just um, a true artist who was actually a soldier in Vietnam and, and was able to take his actual personal experiences and, and, and transcend it in a piece of art. It's incredible. It's like, it is one of the best novels I've, I've, I've ever read, oh. but it's also an example of how Kubrick would take something and take what he thought were the best parts of it and, and turn it into his, his own, his own movie. Well, my, my horror loving daughter, uh, Maya loves that movie too. She loves the shining. <laughs> and, uh, awesome. uh, it's one of her, she, she watched, <laughs> watched it several times. Have you, have you seen ready player one? Have I seen ready player one? Yeah. I couldn't get through it. I, I really yeah I read the this was the one where I read the book first and I really enjoyed the book I thought I thought it was fascinating I thought it was very entertaining and drew me through it well and then I go I went to watch the movie and I uh, 20 minutes in I said I can't really? stomach this oh I, I enjoyed the yeah. movie but there's a, a big shining scene in there that's oh, why I'm I had no idea I had no yes. idea so. um yeah, no, I have some friends who who felt the same way about the movie. They just said, "Oh God, it was just terrible." But they watched the whole thing. I just couldn't do it, and I oh, I, I and, enjoyed it. I did enjoy yeah. it. But there was, I, that's what I'm asking. Maybe you want to first fast forward to that part because okay, is- well now I'll have to I'll have to give it a shot. You know, it's like I <laughs> I and I also cut things off because as I've talked about, my movie going partner, my wife you know, her patience runs out after 20 minutes. And if the second I see her pick up her phone and go to Facebook while we're watching a movie, I say, okay, are we done with this? And she says, I'm done with it. <laughs> and that, and that, that happened with Ready Player One well, for it's, sure. It's, so. a, it's an integral part to the to the movie is the shining scene. So, oh, that's fascinating. Okay, good. There we go. So you're going to have go. to watch that part. That's why it reminded me of that because uh, that is part of it because they visit okay. a lot of different 80s movies in there. And that's one of them. Cool. Awesome. 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 Okay. Well, I will definitely do that. All right, here we go. So, okay. So we're going to go on to the nineties now. Yeah. And uh, you did spoil it last episode for me, but I'm going to say it. Here it is. It, uh, there were some really good ones here too, but my favorite is from dusk till dawn. And, and it's one of the movies and we mentioned it last, last week. It's, I loved it because it, like we said, it starts off as one type of movie and halfway through it becomes something else. It's a, this is not the movie you think you're watching. <laughs> you, yeah. you know, yeah. it's uh, you know you have all these criminals on the run and uh, psychotic, and then all of a sudden 
we're vampires and there's no <laughs> clue of vampires anywhere in the first part of the movie that this is what it's going to be about i mean you know from going in from the trailers but it starts off as something else entirely and that's what makes it so much fun and the scary you know that you're now you're now rooting these bad guys are despicable and now you're rooting for these bad guys to get out because we're facing off with these vampires. <laughs> so it, it was it was just so much fun. Another another Tarantino uh, movie. Uh, he didn't direct it, but he wrote it. But it was just everything was in it. The, the, the vampires were fun. We have uh, we have like old stars of horror movies from the past in it, too. And it was it was just I enjoy it. I've watched it so many times there too because it is funny as well. There's a lot of humor in this movie, and so and that's what I love. I love those horror humor hybrids. And uh, when I did my book, I mean, from uh, you know from sunset till sunrise, a lot of, that's what I had in mind. This movie, you know, <laughs> of course, with yeah. writing it, you know, pick, putting in all the trying to come up with new ways to to address the vampire tropes and so uh it, it's just it's something that i will watch every now and then and i'll even fast forward until we get to the vampire part because <laughs> <laughs> so, i love from that point on it's just so much fun i haven't seen it in so long um and and we were talking about this in our part one of this which i want to bring up back up now because of the image you have behind you psycho we were talking right. about how that's such a pivotal film and storytelling period let alone movies where the heroine is killed off halfway through and it becomes a completely different movie and i brought up from dust till dawn because i recalled that that's what it what it was it was one of the few examples in contemporary film history where you know where a storyteller has has tried to uh tried to do that we shift the entire story halfway halfway through where you don't know what you're watching anymore your actual film is something completely different i think david lynch did it in um it might have been lost highway um where he he did something of course not bizarre for him but bizarre in general and i think that's the film it could be a different one where the lead um uh, I don't know if he's, he's not necessarily the protagonist. He might be essentially kind of the villain in the story. It changes completely. It's a completely different person. It starts out one guy who ends up getting caught going to jail and overnight in jail, he turns into a completely different character. He's just a com different person. And, and, and they have to let him out of jail because they think what happened to the guy we caught or something like this. It's been a long time since I've seen it. So he tried to tell a, a David Lynchian kind of horror story where the where the, the main character shifts halfway through but for no reason he just becomes something for no <laughs> explanation no reason he's just a different person and that's all there is to it so um it's an interesting i think storytelling challenge and i need to watch from dust till dawn again because it's been a long time and i think i would really enjoy it um even even more now because it's like i said it's, it's it's been a long time fun fun movie I, yeah. I, I, I get it. This one, I, I could not tell which one you could like. I mean, they were, I don't even want to mention it until you mentioned your movie because there were some fun ones there. So, but let me hear yours first. <laughs> so. Oh, okay. Well, I, cho I chose the Blair Witch Project. Um, and I'm oh. going to start <laughs> going forward. I'm going to start qualifying my, my horror choices because after the, not after The Shining, it's not so much that, but as my, um, as my film or my movie tastes have further evolved i just the horror genre was just not something that drew me really drew me in and um i saw from dust till dawn on the list and i thought i should pick that one and i thought well you know what i don't remember it well enough to talk about it and i'm glad you did but that would have been one of my other picks and then of course i come across the blair witch project and i thought you know what i've really got to give this this film it's due because it was so groundbreaking in so many ways and I, I found it to be a really 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 truly unnerving um scary ass story uh, because it's a mockumentary it was like mockumentaries had been done before but in different ways some of them I I, I think there was some other example I even, even that the filmmakers probably um were influenced by that was that was a horror 
kind of mockumentary, but but just as just as someone again in the industry that that truly admired innovation of, of any kind, it was it was just it was it, it was just way too smart. I mean, they purposely hired unknown actors so that they could potentially get away with the mythology of this actually somehow being real. The marketing for it was beyond amazing and, and, and had been going on for so many months before the film came out, even though it got a lot of buzz, it was a big deal at Sundance. That's where it was screened and, and picked up by Artisan. I think it was Artisan Pictures. Um, but, but, um, but, but you following these filmmakers going out on a journey to find you know a, a, the Blair Witch to see if it's true or real or not and then getting caught up in the actual the actual potential exposure to all of this it was unresolved nothing was ever really resolved and yet all these creepy things were happening throughout it and all you do is you see it in the handheld camera um as they're going along and and I, I just, I, 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 it is not a particularly good film. That's, that's what's so interesting about it. Um, I, I, I hesitate to say that. It's almost like they, they edited it. They, they, they made it a film intentionally not following. It does follow certain conventions of, of storytelling but then it drops off and it just drops off at the end in such an interesting way that leaves you sitting there going, what the heck is going on? And, and you walk hmm. out with more questions than answers. And I think that's what I kind of liked about it. They drew me through it. They really, really made me uncomfortable and real. I thought it was some just fascinating new ideas for the horror genre that, that, that hadn't been explored before, but the whole mockumentary concept of it. I thought was was just incredibly clever. I, I agree. I thought it was scary. I do think it was a scary movie. Uh, at the end, really, I thought it was really scary. The in the ending, but I, I I have talked to you this before. I can't watch it again. <laughs> it's, I I I hated it the first time just because that the movie got me sick, and I mean not just yeah. sick to the movie just literally sick because i got so dizzy and nauseous watching that shaky handheld cam yeah. with it and I, I read so many things that the the actors were just given a basic synopsis kind of of what has to be done today and they just let them go a lot of it was just improvisation you know just actors on the spur of the moment uh i i read something even yet last night preparing for this that uh, that they even gave them less food <laughs> further into the days to get the actors crankier to have them like you know build the tension and attack each other as we're, they're going along but I, I could not watch it I got so dizzy halfway through this movie that I oh. couldn't wait for it to end <laughs> and yeah, that was a huge complaint for a lot of people. Um, and, and I saw it in the theater, of course, and it was very hard. When you watch it on a, on a even a you know flat screen TV today, it's not. It still might be for you because it is for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. But the camera shake does not um, is not as is not as I don't I don't think jarring as it was seeing it in a movie theater because they they either overdid it or even increased the the shakiness of the camera at times when they thought the the filmmakers had were holding it too steady. Um, and, and yeah, a lot of people complained about getting nauseous or dizzy or sick and, and just it, and couldn't stand it from, from that standpoint. So and, it was a big I complaint. I mentioned it to you, you, I mean, you did the, the homage, I guess the, the Blair Witch Mountain project, <laughs> yeah. which I thought was, I thought was brilliant to do and to, to revisit it, but, and yours was fun and yours was like, what was maybe like 15 minutes, the whole movie. I don't know. Maybe yeah, 12, yeah, 12 minutes. Yes. Yeah, 12 minutes. like that. And. <laughs> Even that, the 15 minutes, 12 minutes was starting to get to me because there were a lot of parts, just the, the handheld thing. And I thought yours was fun because vis revisiting Witch Mountain. If you haven't seen it, go see it. You know, you can, you can find it. You can find it plenty of places that. But it, it really, <laughs> it got to me. But Well, that was, but, one, of the, that was one of the things because after the Blair Witch Project came out, 
um, <clears throat> people started doing spoofs. They were doing like it was like the the Blair. Uh, it, 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 there were there were so many spoofs of the film. Comedians were doing it. Filmmakers were doing it. You know, just amateur f f uh, filmmakers were doing it. And and the the requirements to, to qualify it became a, a, a like a subgenre. Mm -hmm. To qualify for it, you had you had all the set pieces that you had to you had to hit, have you had to I didn't really have it in in mind necessarily, but you had to have the close up of the snotty nose character right. crying yes, into the crying, camera. Right. You had to show the teeth, you know, the bloody teeth. You had to, and it had to be shaky handheld. If it wasn't, then it wasn't. You weren't spoofing it at all. <laughs> and and it actually actually the idea to do it just hit me out of the blue because there were all these spoofs they were coming out there were hundreds of them literally hundreds of them and i was walking through my house and uh, mtv i don't know some entertainment show was talking about the latest blair witch spoof and i just i, I just said the blair witch and literally it rolled off my tongue the blair witch mountain project and i went oh my gosh that's way too funny i've got to do this i've got to do this and so it turned into be it, it ended up being such an incredibly fun um, project to do, and and uh, I, I got Kim Richards, uh, you know, helped me out Kim with it. She, she's point. in it. Brad Savage is in it. Kristen Jutner and Dick Bacallion. And so I, I had I, I I everybody that was around that was willing to work with me on it. I had I had in it. It was just it was so much fun to do, and it ended up being voted one of the top ten Blair Witch oh, spoofs wow. <laughs> um, on on. Um, it, it, yeah, there was a short film distrib distribution company called iFilm. And actually, if you look at it on, on IMDb, it's still listed as one of the top 10 Blair Witch spoofs. Wow. Um, okay. Yeah. So it, 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 it got some traction as far as, as far as that goes. But I had so much fun making it. But anyway, digressing, <laughs> digressing. <laughs> no, well, let's, I, I would recommend people to see it. Okay, now we're going to move on to the 2000s where, okay, you're going to probably guess it because I've told you to watch it anyway. But it's not only in, it's not only in my top horror film of that decade. It's in my probably my top ten movies of my favorites. Period. So we have Shaun of the Dead is my two thousands <laughs> pick. Uh, again, the horror comedy. I thought this was brilliantly done, getting all the the zombie tropes into the movie. Uh, just so much fun. It's another one that I'll probably rewatch once a year as well. And I just love the Simon Pegg, you know, just Edgar Wright. Great, great film. If you haven't, to me, it's still my favorite zombie movie, uh, period. And there are some really good ones. Uh, zombie Land also came out that decade. But Shaun of the Dead, to me, it trumps them all. Uh, you know, I just love this movie. I can't even express enough about this movie. And there were some other good ones in here. And I, I don't know if I, what yours is. I really don't. I looked at that decade. Besides Zombieland, there was Pan's Labyrinth, which was great. Uh, Coraline, which was so much fun too <laughs> to me. But Shaun of the Dead is it. Well, I, I picked it too, and I, I um, did you? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I did. Absolutely. Wow. And and yeah, as you were just sharing, you, you recommended that I that I watch it for, and I'm outing us a project that we're working on together. And mm -hmm. and I I. It was it was a movie. I'll be honest with you. I had zero interest in seeing. I never cared I, when it came out. I thought Shaun of the Dead. Oh God, a zombie movie. Oh geez, I don't know. And I, you know, I wasn't necessarily familiar with uh, with Simon Pegg. <clears throat> Scar excuse me, Simon Pegg. Um, and I couldn't figure out how you could make a zombie movie funny. I mean, I just I judged it harshly uh, from from a distance. So I, and, and, and again, like I said before my taste is was moving away from horror films. So it's like not something that I really, I really, you know, was, was interested in. It just wasn't on my radar. So when you suggested that I watch it and you talk so highly, spoke so highly of it, I thought, okay, I'm going to sit down and watch it. I flipping loved it. I absolutely loved so it. Happy. <laughs> and, and yeah, no, no, no. I mean, it's, 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 it is, it's, it's beyond you know, it did, it, 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 it did something extraordinarily difficult. It, it, it's a horrific film and it doesn't get horrific till very deep into the movie. I mean, and I say that because they used the zombie, I mean, the comedy elements are, are, are there off the bat from the first frame of the film, you start get, you start smirking and giggling because Simon Pegg's character is just so pathetic and he's just so 
awkward. And he's, you know, when you, when you think about, I mean, this has always been kind of even Adam Sandler's go-to, um, you know, yeah, I'll play a character that does dumb things, but only to get my girlfriend back. If, you know, if I can get my girlfriend back, I'll do the dumbest things you, 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 anyone, any filmmaker wants to, wants me to do. And that's, that's, he's, he's reshaped screenplays based upon that simple, um, that simple, <laughs> that simple direct. So that's what this film is. He's just trying to get his girlfriend back. That's, a, that's that he screwed up his entire relationship. And yet he's in the midst of a zombie apocalypse and all these characters are. And yeah, I'm going on about it because I just want to, I, I want to fill in my, you know, my thoughts. You really like the friendships, this small group of people that end up being stuck in a place to try to figure out how to survive zombies that are everywhere. And they just keep coming more and more and more of them come out there are some really, you know, just chilling moments where they have to kill a zombie here or there. And it's done again with that, in that way that I enjoy and appreciate so much, it's done cinematically. You see them beating the brains out of, of some zombie, but you don't see it because it's off camera. You just see them smashing it with whatever instrument they've got to affect the end of this creature you could just imagine how ugly it is and most movies would show you that right off the bat just for the shock value of it but they hold off a long time until you've got this tight group of people that are trying to survive and then all of a sudden four of them just get wiped out in the in in in, in three or four minutes and the first one that does is torn apart on camera by this whole group of zombies his guts are ripped out his arms are pulled up he's dismembered oh and i just sat there going oh my god this is horrifying <laughs> this is so horrifying and 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 oh god it's well crafted it's incredibly well crafted especially the way the the filmmaker and, and I did read the script first, which was quite fun for me to do because I enjoy doing that every once in a while, getting a chance to read it and then see how it's interpreted on film. Mm -hmm. The way the director would drop in the, the, the hints about, about the zombies early on, I mean, very, very early on, where you might see a piece of one or maybe not, or maybe it started, you're starting to see something, you're thinking, what the heck is that? I mean, you know what it is because it's a zombie movie, but... But the way that was pieced out, I just thought was incredibly clever. And, um, you know, the use just, you know, it, this is a this is a trope or, you know, it's a convention, but using, you know, news flashes to fill in the backstory to explain what's going on was so cleverly done. I, I, I yeah, I, I, I absolutely, I absolutely, uh, I absolutely loved it. I really did and oh, and I'm, I'm pleased <laughs> yeah yeah there you go so we do had we did have one in common one you, one we made it all you you have little faith <laughs> but th that's primarily because you made me watch it because if i hadn't watched it i wouldn't know what to pick from that decade i've never been able to watch pan's La labyrinth because i don't want to read subtitles and i know that's horrible um i i Good totally movie. respect i is it is that guillermo del toro yes, yes. Another yeah. one of my daughter's favorites. <laughs> yes. Spanish filmmaker. I've actually worked on a couple of his films. Um, and I totally respect him wanting to keep it in the Spanish language. I think that was absolutely um, a wonderful thing to do and never and never dub it. But I just don't want, I, I don't enjoy reading subtitles. Um, yeah, the only oh, one son. I ever did, <laughs> the only one I ever did enjoy was uh, Das Boat. And I did see it in the theater with subtitles. That's easier on the big screen for me than even glancing up and down on a, at home. So yeah, that's my, uh, that's my excellent anyway movie. But it's I, I have no doubt. I mean, it's like on a bunch of lists and it's been hailed and praised and I would, I'm going to have to force myself to watch it uh, <laughs> one day, you know? So there, <laughs> well, go. one of the, one of them, I didn't pick this in, in fun time. I didn't pick it as my favorite, but there's one of the dead actually. Which oh, is I think I've heard of that. That sounds hilarious. Really funny movie there. It's, it's you know, set in Cuba. And they think that uh, they think that the, the zombies are like, you know, Americans trying to invade them. <laughs> so it's very very funny film it, it also and i i do love it and i did did not pick it i'm going to get absolutely killed and i was 
going between two, but, and one of them, uh, we talked about this week, you and I was Tucker and Dale versus evil. I didn't pick that either, but that was, it was, that was my toss up one, but uh-huh. here we go. All right, please. And as, like I said before, I welcome your comments. <laughs> but I picked just because it's so much fun. And I've watched this dozens and dozens of time was goosebumps. I do love the series. I love the series of books. I thought the first movie was just incredibly fun. I, I love Jack Black and anything he does also. And this was such a fun movie. And they had they did have legitimate scares in here with the, the dummy, but I could watch that again and again and again. And it's funny and scary. And like I said, I do love the books too. So I went with Goosebumps as, as my 2010s. Well, I, ha- I have not seen Goosebumps. I'm a big Jack Black fan as well. And I, I have not seen it. So I'm going to have to watch it now that you've qualified <laughs> it that way. Um, but, but, but here I go. I just don't watch horror movies. And yet I have watched two from the 2010s. And I'm going to get beat up for this also. I didn't really like either one of these. But because <laughs> I've seen them and I have to make a pick... Of the two that I didn't really care for, I'm going to pick A Quiet Place. Um, and the other one is Get Out. Um, I, I, I thought it had so much about it that was absolutely fantastic. But overall, for, I, and, and I don't know how to qualify this or explain this, but I think the same thing happened for me with A Quiet Place um, as well as Get Out, that there's, there's, there's something that's being diluted in movies these days that that either the writers or the filmmakers I, I don't know what it is but it's like they don't quite seem to reach that pitch that I need to get excited about them despite how well made they are and how much they draw me along um because we all know you know the, the the climax of the film is everything if you if, if, if you don't give a real payoff to what you've set up then then you lose me and of course you're going to lose a lot of other people and these are wildly popular films they're they're um they're 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 highly regarded and um um but in picking the quiet a quiet place i was disappointed probably because i read the original screenplay again before (laughs) i watched the movie and um the you know the uh the director rewrote the script. He he kind of gutted some of what I thought were the more interesting things that gave the story some depth. And um, and one one of the aspects of the script that really caught me, um, and I felt like the moment in the actual film was lost. Um, he's the father character, and they're they're trying to obviously sur- survive in this. In this environment where these alien uh these alien creatures hunt by sound they're blind they hunt by sound so being stuck out on a farm away from civilization with limited ways in which to protect themselves they have to live this what this life of almost complete silence and um and in in, in order to help in order to help save his family or save, um, I believe it's his daughter at a certain point in the story, the father sacrifices himself, screams out loud to draw the monster away and ends up getting eaten and torn apart. So his, his child can survive and get back to the, the mother and the new more baby and all of this. And, um, and it's a very pivotal moment in the story in the original script. It was like, God, it was just heart wrenching the way it happened and the the manner in which it happened and all of a sudden in the movie i felt like oh god he kind of like just sort of glossed over that it just didn't <laughs> it didn't impact me so maybe i'm being unfair to the film if you know, you know often when we see these things you know like the shining you see the shining first as a movie and then the the book perhaps disappoints if it goes the other way around, the movie might disappoint, you know, so this, this happens all the time, but anyway, so I had to pick something cause I've seen no horror movies from the <laughs> 2010s, except those two. And I had to pick one. So I'll say the quiet place I thought was the better one because I do like, I do like the sci-fi aspects of it. Um, and um, so there it is. 
go ahead go right. ahead Ro <laughs> roast me roast me <laughs> <laughs> well I, I am going to make you watch Tucker and Dale versus Evil at one point. Oh, 100 so. percent, because you're, you're the second person um, in the last two weeks that brought it up. And I've never heard of this movie. So there you go. I'm going to have to watch so it. So much fun. But, <laughs> yeah, you know, like I said, I, I, I know this one's going to get killed because there are really real horror movies there. But like like we said at the beginning, this is all subjective. And oh, yeah. It's our personal taste. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but please but I, but I am anticipating the hate comments but, <laughs> oh i look forward to them i want to <laughs> <laughs> but again l let us know your thoughts below you know good or bad if you agree disagree what some of your favorites were and uh this was fun this was i had a fun time with this and uh oh me too this is a blast yeah I, I don't know if you're doing anything good for halloween you know that night Oh, we always hang out, and um, where we live, uh, we be, we get inundated with thousands upon thousands of people. I'm not kidding, um, who come into our our little community and um, and hit the streets. So we get we get a big kick about just sitting on our front porch and watching everyone. You know, yeah, watching everyone and all the kids in their costumes. It's a it's it's a real blast. So yeah, that's what we we do every I year. Love and I'm, I'm, I'm looking I think forward it's such to it. A yeah, fun time. Yes. Yeah, oh, time. absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, you know, it's fun to write about. <laughs> these things too but uh anyway like i said <laughs> let us know your thoughts happy halloween to everyone and uh again this weekend go see dear ike at the orlando <laughs> film festival and uh, and we hope you enjoy it and as always thank you for watching uh i'm jonathan rosen along with ike eisenman this has been pop culture retro and please subscribe bye-bye Thank you for listening to Pop Culture Retro, where no one was hurt during the making of this podcast.